tell you about a game that was actually launched yesterday, uh, very timely, that you can, you can actually play when you come and visit the Vindolanda site. It was a project that was linked between the kind of archaeology and ancient history departments at Newcastle University, the Vindolanda Trust, and actually the Newcastle Games Lab, which is through their, their computer science department. Uh, the project was largely funded through the Arts Council, so uh, thank you to the Arts Council, and we had kind of legacy funding through the Roman Research Trust. And we wanted to create a 2D narrative. Uh, we didn't go 3D with this particular game because 3D costs a lot of money. So we were we, we kind of kept with that sort of 2D narrative. Uh, we wanted to do a narrative story because we wanted to use the app for seven to 11 year olds. And I know that seems like a very specific age range, but for those of you who know the national curriculum here in England, um, seven to 11 is your key stage two and the Romans actually are on the key stage two national curriculum. So by and large, most of the children groups, school groups, um, often we get a lot of families within that age because the children have just studied the Romans. And so we thought for our first kind of jump into this type of work to go with the 7 to 11s would be a good idea. We also wanted to make sure that it was related back to objects and uh, buildings and such that were found on the site. And we thought a detective story, because who doesn't like a, a good whodunit, um, would be a good way to do this. We wanted to promote our heritage and inspire education. Now, as I've said that it was for 7 to 11 year olds, um, as I've talked to many people, as we've, we've promoted this game, I've heard a number of adults who said, yes, we want to actually come and play this game as well. And there's nothing that says people either younger or older can't come on site to play the game. So as I said, based on a whodunit here at Vindolanda, back in 2010, from the excavations, we found a skeleton. Um, we don't tend to excavate in the, um, the cemeteries, uh, so we don't have a lot of human remains. Reese has already talked about probably the other kind of two human remains that we have from the site. Um, unfortunately, with all of them, they, they have uh, some nasty or some, some undesirable undertones, and this individual was buried in a shallow grave in the barracks. So what do we know about the human remains? We know it's a child. We know that the child was between eight and 11 years old. No obvious injuries, no long-term ill health, about four and a half feet tall. Um, lead isotope analysis shows that the um, teeth were a person who was living in the Mediterranean until just before um, they died. We have tried to do DNA, um, but unfortunately the bones are in too poor of condition, so we haven't been able to get any analysis off of DNA. Again, I said it was a shallow kind of burial. We don't know how the person died. We don't know if, if the person had any clothing. Uh, there was, of course, textiles wouldn't survive at this kind of level, so we don't have any brooches or um, hobnails or anything like that that would be, be left over. Um, we don't know who they were. We don't know the sex. Um, at this age, normally sex would be uh, very hard to ID. The physical anthropologist has said she thought it was probably a girl, um, but that, that can't be completely identified. At this age, they, would, um, they don't usually show signs of sexing in skeletons until they uh, have hit puberty. So that, that's quite difficult. And of course, we don't know who killed them. So this, led to an interesting sort of story in our mind. And what the, the, the game actually does is completely conjecture. And it is uh, marked at the beginning that this is one of the possible stories, that it's not the, uh, the, the definite story about what happened. Uh, I will also say, because it deals with human remains, that is identified early in, at the beginning of the game to say, you know, if people don't want to deal with, with human remains, that that is their choice. Um, it starts with the archaeologist back in 2010 finding the the actual skeleton. You'll see that it's kind of a we wanted to go with a kind of a graphic novel sort of style of the artwork. Um, and then we kind of in Scooby Doo sort of fashion go back to um, about 230 when we think the actual remains were, were 
were actually deposited. And we meet Marcus and he is our detective. He's based at Magna. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about Magna later on this, after, or this morning, um, but he's based at Magna and he's asked if he would go along to visit his old friend Vitalis at Vindolanda to help him find some missing property. Off Marcus goes to the actual site. Um, you can see here the kind of reconstruction um, drawing uh, in that sort of form. And as Marcus goes around, he visits different parts of the site. He collects different types of, of objects. Uh, he puts people into his case files so he can start to think about who might have been a whodunit. Um, but Marcus never actually finds out what happened to the, the, the skeleton in the Roman period because then he would have solved the case and we wouldn't have found the, the remains in the barrack room. So it's, it's kind of a left open and allows the children to use their deductive reasoning, um, which is very a big part of the national curriculum at key stage two. So they're supposed to infer and they're supposed to, to work those things out themselves. So there, there's an intention there um, within the curriculum. So the last kind of, I don't have a huge amount of time to talk about the game, so I'm not gonna go through all of the different drawings and the rest of the story. You can download it um, on the Play Store and you can play it in your home, especially if you know the site or you can come on site and actually play it. But what I wanted to talk about is some of how we got to where we did with the game and some of the lessons learned. So, of course, you, you go and you find reconstructions to help the artist to, to develop these things. Uh, here's the reconstructions from um, Arbea, their commanding officer's residence, and you look at uh, you know other kind of existing evidence. So our, our artist wanted to put some uh, paintings onto the bathhouse walls. And of course he had very modern looking dolphins and we had to say, no, 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 Romans wouldn't have dolphins that looked like that. So, so mosaics and, and other uh, paintings, inscriptions, objects were used. And this was an interesting process to where we were able to help the artist kind of develop his skill. He had the artistic skill, but he needed to have that interpretation skill. We used objects throughout the, the, the from the Vindolanda collection throughout the game, and the Marcus, the as the children are playing, can pick up these objects. So we've got the gladiator glass, which is found in the tavern. We've got the toilet seat, the wooden toilet seat, which is found in the actual latrine, and of course the bullheaded lamp, the bronze lamp that was found within the commanding officer's residence, and and that's where it's actually found in the, the game. We also helped the, the artists to look at what they were actually putting on there so that there is that authenticity. Um, and I would like to thank both Rob Collins of Newcastle University and Andrew Burley, who helped us, uh, Andrew's the archeologist at Vindolanda, to actually take from what we saw, we see here, which is a very um, sort of artistic impression of a Roman soldier uh, into kind of this sort of image, which is much closer to what we would think of as the Roman soldier. Now these are two guards that feature in the game. It's still not perfect because he's got these spikes on the helmet, which I think we'd all kind of agree spikes on the helmet aren't what they're supposed to be. But you can see the process as he starts to put these things together. We were also helping the artist to, to look at images like this one. Now this is the barrack, the, the road that goes through the barracks down towards the temple of Jupiter Dalacanus. And this is an initial sketch. Um, and notice the, the number plaques just at the top of the doors. Well, this is the image that's actually used in the game. Now, first of all, you'll notice that the perspective is dropped down to a children's level. Also, the temple at the back is much closer to a representation of a Romano-Celtic temple than the kind of uh, you know, columned temple that one would, would expect to see in, in kind of traditional Roman sort of uh, interpretation. This is because there was not a column one found um, anywhere near the Dolichanum. So we were using that archaeological evidence to make sure that it was correct. The other thing to notice is the numbers on the door. No longer are they on the little plaques at the top, but the numbers on the door reflect artifacts that have actually been found at the site. If you go to the wooden uh, underworld gallery that, that Annika was talking about earlier, you'll be able to see two door panels, uh, door number three and door number 14. Um, and we were able to use that information and bring it into the actual interpretation on the game. 
little things like the windows. I know it sounds like such a small thing, but I was really interested in making sure that the windows looked correctly. Um, our artist originally had a nice big square window. Uh, of course, uh, no evidence for that at Vindolanda. Um, Becky in her talk yesterday showed a, a fabulous kind of remains of a window pane. Um, and you can see here that we've got them just like one would expect to find in, in a Roman window pane. So it was that attention to detail that was really important. Then there was the game playability. Uh, and we had to look at how we could make this work for a, a child. And we brought in Aquila here, the eagle. Uh, if you've been to the Roman Army Museum, you might have visited our 3D film there. And it's taken the eagle's eye view of the of Hadrian's Wall between Vindolanda and Magna. And so we decided to use the character of the eagle again. And he's the one that helps you go, right, you need to pick that up. You need to click here. You need to do this and you need to do that. And to help the child actually be able to go from one point of the game to the next. So he's kind of your narrator, if you will. And we used a map throughout the site so that the, the player can actually get to the different um, locations. In the game itself, there's a nice little line that says, you know, you're starting here on the site, you need to go to the West Gate. And then it shows you a little route that you're supposed to take as you go through there. We trialed this game with a number of children, both through school groups and through kind of um, kind of sharing and, and, and workshop days on the actual site. Every single child, nobody had a, a single bit of problem with the idea of a um, murder, uh, because that's what we're kind of, you know, underlying saying, because it's a mystery. Uh, we didn't have any child that uh, didn't like the idea of a story that they walked around the site. But what struck me was how many enjoyed seeing the reconstruction. So as you can see on the phone there, you've got the, the view of the barrack. And in the background, you've got the view as it looks today. Of course, short walls um, and the, the kind of open landscape. And as I was taking a seven-year-old around on one of these workshop days, early on, he was like, is that what it would have looked like? And I said, well, in cartoon form. But yes, that's, that's an impression of what it would have looked like. And his is just immediate wow. And as we continued around the site, he was like, so would that be what it looked like? Was that what it was looked like? And every time there was, there was a, a feeling of understanding and interest. And I think that, that that linking, which works out quite nicely with what Annika and Reese have said this morning, is that linking between the real and digital outputs is so, so important. So when you actually look at it, you go, this is what it would have looked like in the landscape very, very good way of doing this. So what happens now? Um, so as I said, the game was launched yesterday. Um, we are gonna continue to work with Newcastle University um, with their games lab and their ancient history and archeology span departments to do new projects. Um, we decided that we would start to look at the Roman Army Museum and what we could do there. Uh, we have a regiment of Hamian archers from Syria and Within the legacy money, we decided we'd try to get some kind of tasters so that when we go to show uh, the grants, people people that we're applying to grants for, that we can, can encourage them to, to actually support the project. And here's the example of a Syrian helmet that was, that was created. We would love to look at, and we have a different opportunity within the Roman Army Museum, more AR, VR sort of opportunities as we couldn't really do that across the Vindolanda site. Um, I think everybody can agree that walking across an archeological site with VR glasses would be a rather difficult um, endeavor. So that is in a very short nutshell, uh, a little bit about the stories from the frontier, the, the game, The Missing Dead. Uh, like I said, you can download it off the Play Store. You can't quite download it just yet for Apple. Um, it's, a, it's a bit more complicated getting Apple, um, not helped by the fact of COVID and then the uh, people from the game labs not being able to access the on-site uh, equipment that they need at the university, but we are hoping to be able to launch it on Apple in um, in December. So you'll be able to, to see that then. Uh, I'm more than happy to take any questions uh, and I hope that you'll get the opportunity to come and play the game on site.